Okay, so thank you all for coming along firstly, because I know that a mitre attack, high level overview, yeah, it doesn't sound like the most appealing talk. Um, to give you some context as to who I am and where I'm coming from, APG manager of cyber intelligence working for Symantec. What does that mean? They don't let me near sales. Um, we're focused very much on in internal security, protecting Symantec from people coming after it. Uh, two and a half years in cyber intel in the Australian financial sector and five and a half years working for the Australian government. I'm really looking at the lens of being a cyber noob, but also looking at the looking through the lens of the operational to strategic landscape, trying to stop the attack bingo card from coming along before it comes along. The scope, of course, I'm very, very biased. Not aimed at a technical audience. Anyone in this room could certainly bury me if we started talking technical and that last talk frightens me and that guy's never taught touching my laptop. <laughs> Thinking very much in that adversary-centric mindset. I'm all about the person behind the keyboard, trying to figure out how they think and who they're going to come after. And the standard disclaimer, last two points there. So again, the background. We all know why we're starting to use frameworks and things like that. One of the things that I really like about the MITRE ATT&CK framework is the pitch is right. Risk teams are starting to understand it. Sometimes can be a good thing. But it's becoming a common language that is at the right level for inter-organisation and intelligence sharing within teams as well. The reason why I'm saying that it's at the right level is that if you go too deep when you're starting to share intelligence about some sort of an incident that you've seen, you start giving away how to hack into your network. You start giving away your company vulnerability. But if you abstract back to that MITRE attack level and a little bit deeper, you start being able to share some actually interesting and relevant experiences. And it's starting to really solve that problem of the poor communication leading to some real significant failings. Naturally, everyone in the room, thank you for putting your hands up. Um, everyone understands it. It really is that babel fish. And again, that not too detailed. It's rapidly becoming another industry standard. Doesn't take away from the work of the Veris and CAPEC frameworks. But again, I think it's that abstraction back which is letting us use this talk to management and talk to people who are less technical by nature and by trade, but they're the ones making the policy decisions that are affecting all of our lives all of the time, particularly when it goes bad. This is certainly my opinion. I think that hunt operations, detection engineering, incident response plans and playbooks, and especially cyber intelligence, should all use the MITRE ATT&CK framework as much as humanly possible, because then everyone's speaking the same language. If someone's talking about a particular way of doing something or pretty much anything, we're all starting to speak that same language. I've seen a number of failings before, both in my time in government as well as my time out of government, when one organisation is talking to another organisation using a common term, the trouble is, is the definition of that common term between the two organisations is entirely different. Uh, and that can certainly lead to some suboptimal outcomes. And also it can help educate management. This is going to be the ongoing theme throughout the presentation itself. And it's trying to get the security community to get ahead of the bingo card message, to get ahead of what's happening and where the industry in general is starting to move, and trying to stop my manager from turning around and going, I want a tick in every box on this particular grid. And again, the bias. Attack in itself has some bias. The size and scope of all the different techniques, naturally, definitely check out the attack con videos that are there and around. Uh, talking about the depth of PowerShell, for example, is really, really relevant. A lot of the conversations with attack also comes to, not everything's relevant to my organisation or my organisation needs to work outside of the matrix. 
that's a really good thing. Being able to understand that attack is not necessarily going to cover 100% of everything that you see, but when you can, and when you can communicate in that common message, use it because it's there. Um, that's certainly relevant depending on the size of some of the organisations being represented in this room and some of the size of the security teams as well. You will undoubtedly see things that are sitting way outside the attack matrix. And then when it comes to actually communicating that message to other organisations, that might help you actually sit back and say, I need to define exactly what I'm talking about a lot tighter and a lot and a, kind of, yeah, define everything a lot more. And so I certainly encourage people thinking outside the matrix. Some of the stuff that we do is set up temporary designators for things that are sitting outside the matrix. So then when MITRE themselves roll out a new edition of the attack framework or something like that, we can translate those temporary designators back in where applicable or continue having them as temporary designators. It's a bit of an interesting one and a tricky one to cover as well. The other shortcomings when using MITRE ATT&CK, analyst shortcomings, certainly including mine, uh, automa automation being the goal. Wouldn't it be great uh, if we could automate everything? Trouble is we can't. And of course, is it still too high level? Uh, I tend to think of MITRE ATT&CK as I'm going to talk to my supervisors or my seniors. I don't think of MITRE ATT&CK necessarily as I'm going to present a piece of paper matrix to my hunt team and say, here's how APT10 roll or here's how someone operates. Because my hunt team will look at that piece of paper, scrunch it up and throw it back at me and say it's not detailed enough. And they do. It's happened. <laughs> So looking at some hypothetical scenarios, I think it's a really nice way to uh, introduce some of the trade craft that we're using to influence our management in the correct way. Naturally, a slide full of caveats. Definitely have a look at your own incident response data. I'm going to short circuit the system and very much use the data that's available from MITRE themselves. And some of the things that I'm going to do is start borrowing from geospatial analysis. People have been reading maps forever. Some people succeed, some people fail at reading maps. <laughs> but I'm going to start borrowing and stealing from cartographic design principles. Map makers, their whole job is putting a piece of paper in front of you as a manager or as someone who wants to get from point A to point B and achieve a certain goal. You need to be able to look at this really quickly, understand the message, and then make a decision. So I'm going to start stealing some tips and tricks that I learned back in when I was doing some geospatial analysis. I'm going to do things like present my work on a piece of paper to my manager, and I'm going to stare at him. The reason why I'm staring at him is not just to freak him out but it's to follow his eyes and look at where he's looking on the page. And we'll start touching on some of that stuff as well. And instead of saying defensive posture, I'm going to try and broaden scope a bit to actually include detection as well. Uh, and I certainly live very much within the assumed compromise mindset. I just think that everything is wrecked all the time. Some people call it paranoia, I call it assumed compromise. <laughs> so asking some of these questions, uh, looking very much at my own organisation. Where do I work? Probably important. Who's coming after me and who's coming after my organisation? How do those adversaries operate? How does that align to my data? Am I seeing the same thing or am I seeing something completely different? And most importantly as well, how does this align to my competitors' data? If I'm a bank, I really want to know what's wrecking other banks. Not because I can sit there and go, you got wrecked. It's so I can sit there and say, well, OK, are we going to start seeing some of that same behaviour on our networks? Because that's a really bad scenario. I'm just going to short circuit everything and leave those seeds planted and we'll have a look and see what MITRE have to say. 
Again, being an ex-banky, finance sector, who am I worried about and what am I worried about? Financial loss naturally being number one. Swift, ATMs and ATM backend infrastructure, especially when people start referring to Swift, uh, to ATM backend infrastructure as switches. It took me a long time to figure out the difference there, far too long. <laughs> I'm also worried about the theft of personally identifiable information. That can be, I don't want customer data stolen, but that should also expand to, if I'm running a bank that also runs in another country, am I worried about an espionage related actor? Or if I'm a bank moving into another country, am I worried about someone conducting some sort of espionage for competitive gain? I think that that's one very, very interesting point, which is starting to appear more and more, is espionage for competitive gain. I'm also worried about intellectual property theft. Uh, when I'm talking about intellectual property within the financial sector, I'm talking about that big bucket of analytics which has run over all this excellent customer data to then try and sell you things. Uh, being able to understand and work through that, particularly if you're working at somewhere like a major financial institution. So the first thing I did was have a look, okay, let's have a look at a matrix, an attack matrix, and I brought this one up. And yes, the font is remarkably small, intentionally so, because I'm trying to keep your, re keep your eyes away from the words themselves. This is a comparison between the Lazarus group and the Cobalt group. These colours were a terrible decision. And think about why. I put this in front of a manager and I said, tell me what you see. And he said, green is good, I'm detecting everything in green, Orange, eh, red is bad. I'm like, oh, that's terrible. A really, really, really bad idea because green is not good. But that's the element that we're dealing with when it comes to management, right? I look at a piece of paper and I just think traffic lights. It's a really nice way of visualising it because the colours contrast quite well. But my management read it as traffic lights. So that's my failing as someone trying to communicate to that manager. So rather than that, I spun things around and I added Carbonac just to mix it up a little bit. But I started presenting things in a heat map mode. Darker colour, lighter colour, a white to a red, because red is bad, red is something I want you to focus on. And I started having a look and explaining some of those core red bits the actual product that I sent to the manager doesn't, I've actually removed all of the places where there was no scoring. And so my manager only got the actual coloured squares. This is part of what I mean about fighting that detection bingo card. If you present your manager with a bunch of white squares and then a bunch of red squares, your manager may look at both as an equal and valid proposition and say, well, what about all these white ones? Can't we detect things here? OK, I'll just remove them when I'm talking to my manager because, in my opinion, that's not relevant to my network, that's not relevant to my attackers, that's irrelevant information. So I'm going to make your job as a manager easier to focus on what actually counts. Also, we can start bringing out things, things to note and very much as a narrative form. Looking again at the energy sector, I'm more worried about things like facilitating disruption, uh, intellectual property theft again, theft of personally identifiable information, hacktivists and things like that as well. There's a different set of threat actors that operate in a different way for the energy sector when compared to the finance sector and also when compared to semantic where I am now. Understanding the differences there when you're looking beyond the commodity level is very, very important. And this is where it almost slides a little bit more into that kind of risk function or something like that, looking at an organisation that has targeted industries like mine. Very, very similar scenario, right? You're looking at the heat map style of thing. 
being able to talk to and articulate to management the reason why we're seeing a bit of bias in this heat map as well. Maybe there's more reporting on particular adversary sets doing particular sets of activity. Also keeping in mind visibility bias as well. Just because, it, just because you can't see it doesn't mean that it's not happening. Schrodinger's attack. Again, that's where a little narrative starts kicking in and the things to note. So the drive-by compromise, the system owner discovery and things like that. We can start in a narrative or a sit-down session explaining some more of that deeper level um, knowledge to management, but again, making sure that we actually translate it in such a way. There was an interesting talk that I attended uh, back with the, the ABC were putting on a series of podcasts for their science show. And what they were talking about throughout the podcast series for that evening was the importance of science communicators. Essentially letting the scientist carry on with the experiment while the communicator stepped up, translated what the scientist was doing to the public, to the management, to the people that are paying for the research trying to harness the skills of the technical, pe technical people and not letting them get bogged down in PowerPoint, which they'll probably find very frustrating. And again, another scenario, the hospitality retail sector, theft of PII, point of sale compromise, credit card compromise and theft. No big surprises in the adversary space here. This is big time media, it's affecting everyone. But it's interesting to see the differences in techniques. But more importantly, by reorganising and reshuffling the way the MITRE matrix looks, my managers are getting the correct articulation of the viewpoint. It's really important considering people in Western countries read from left to right, top to down, to actually format the matrix in that way because I want someone to actually pay attention to the stop, to the top of the page before they get distracted by a phone call, before they get distracted by an SMS message or something like that. I need them to actually get to that point. Some of the things that I really want to try now is mapping all the vendor feeds into this. All the vendors are saying that they're starting to do attack matrix and attack mapping, so let's give it a shot adding a lot more of our own incident data into this mix as well. And I want to see what visibility and collection gaps start appearing. That certainly speaks to some of that Schrodinger's attack. Just because I'm not seeing an attack happening, is that a detection problem? Or is that attack genuinely actually not happening? I'm really curious as well, because I'm always thinking in that adversary-centric mindset, People are creatures of habit. They do things in the same way. Back when I was mulling around with DOS prompts and hiding and unhiding files because my parents knew how to use a computer, I would sit there and I would run the flags for particular things in certain ways because that's how I remembered them and that's what made sense to me in my brain at the time. I remember talking to one of my friends and seeing him run the exact same set of, of the exact same command, but all the flags were in a completely different order. And I was like, oh, never even thought about running it that way. I was running it because rash makes an English word, and so therefore that's how I remembered it. But it's things like that. I really want to start experimenting with seeing if we can see a bit more human behavior and a bit more fingerprinting. We will achieve peak intel, shall we say, if I can pick up an incident response set of reports, gather all of that information and actually group that campaign in together. It'd be even better if then, by using open source, we can start hypothesizing about some attribution. And also prioritizing detection strategies as well, right? If all of the adversaries that I think are coming after me all use certain things, then I want to be able to turn around to my hunt and detection team and say, maybe we need to focus on detecting this before that. 
there's a whole range of complications in there, obviously, and you won't be able to just tick through in order one, two, three, four, five. But it's certainly some way of prioritising and starting to shake out the noise that appears. And also the standardising and automating for analysis, the dream. The place where I'd start to think about wrapping up is mainly saying thank you to all the people in this room. Thank you to the people who run these conferences and thank you to people who are open to sharing their ideas. Because I'm not out here by myself. I'm standing very much on the shoulders of giants and I'm trying to add to that collaborative body of knowledge which is starting to spin up and really starting to focus. Certainly thanks to the guys, over at, the guys and girls over at MITRE for doing things like the attack con, putting all the videos on the internet and things like that. The various open source projects, again, looking at it from a non-technical noob kind of level and being able to leverage some of the work that already exists and just spinning it round to try and speak to that non-technical audience. And most of all, thanks to anyone who's actually curious about how things work and stuff like that. I did notice some tricks in the badge before. But yeah, so very fast talk. And I know that I've probably thrown the schedule again looking at Scotty as he stares at his watch. <laughs> but thank you all for attending as well. Definitely, I'm curious about taking questions and I'm curious about hearing your thoughts, particularly when dealing with some of these minor attack elements. And if we start working and educating and management now, fingers crossed we can avoid the bingo card that will pop up. Cheer. Thank you very much. We have a question. Um, from your finance experience, is the finance sector already using this to share intel? The question was, is the finance sector using this already to share intel? It's starting to. Starting to. And it's because there was like a little intel sharing community that started just kind of shrieking about it all at the same time. <laughs> It's been around for a while, but the last year, it's just all of a sudden, it is everywhere. Mm. You know, it just has that common language. It's been surprising, actually, how quickly it's, uh, it's caught on. Would you say? Yeah, definitely. And I think one of the strengths for it as well is that as an analyst, if I look at a really detailed framework, I'll get locked into analysis paralysis. I won't know if something belongs into that or that, and then my brain kind of locks up. But with the MITRE ATT&CK framework, it's a little bit more straightforward. All right, do we have any other questions? All right, everybody, please thank Kevin Cleary. Thank you.